Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I hope it is recording. <laughs> So no, the, the the cable connection is not working. But it might it might be just to the connector. Uh, no sharing. Okay. The uh, green outline disappeared. So, but it says to to add. As we start, no, Crystal, sure. the last one is there. Sure. Not, the pointer is working. I guess I'll point on the screen. So it's there. Okay. Shall we start, everyone? So, so, thank you so much for coming. It's a great pleasure to introduce Srijan Sujit. Uh, really big fan of his work. Um, so just introduce him. He studied at Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne. He did a PhD in theoretical physics actually in Amsterdam when I was doing my undergrads there as well. Um, and then went on, uh, well, maybe I should say he actually studied there on networks as well, but then in granular matter, so like dunes and apples. And then he went on to do to study networks in the brain uh, here in NS in Paris, with Vincent uh, Hakim and Nicolas Brunel. And then what uh, the Marie Curie Fellowship went to New York to study with Stefano Fusi on, on neural manifolds, so like, the, like low dimensional representations of neural activity. And then with, um, yeah, after that, he went to, to start his own lab in Ernest Paris in 2012. And so really combining more classical neural networks with more advanced um, techniques to understand the dynamics of neural populations. So with further ado, Thank you so much for coming. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Timo, for inviting me. So it's actually my first time in uh, Nurspin and Sakhalil together. So I'm very glad to, to, to be here. Um, so before starting, I, I want to acknowledge the people who, uh, who, who, who did the whole work. So this whole line of research started with uh, uh, Francesca Master Giuseppe, who moved on as uh, well, she's actually now at Champollion, not at Gatsby anymore. And the work I will be presenting today uh, was led by uh, Alexis Dubreuil, um, Adrian Valente, and Manuel Beran. And we have also very close collaboration with uh, Friedrich Schussler and uh, Omri Barak at, at Technion. I hope, yeah. I, I, it's a little bit strange this hybrid situation because I'm, I'm kind of talking to the Zoom, but I, I hope you can hear me too. So, <laughs> uh, so, um, so we're, we're yeah. So we are a computational neuroscience group. So our, uh, the goal of our research is to understand how uh, the millions of neurons uh, that constitute the brain work together to produce computations. So what uh, what do I mean computations? Well, I mean tasks like this, where uh, an animal or a human sees the stimulus out of the continuum, and then on the basis of the stimulus need to make, make a decision um, to obtain eventually a reward. Uh, so uh, suppose that we record a, a couple of thousands or a couple of millions of, 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 of neurons in, in, in some brain area while uh, the animal does this task. So th the question for us is how do we interpret this neural activity to understand how neurons perform uh, computations? And uh, so, well, 
currently there's a bit of a dichotomy in in in, in the broad field of, of system neuroscience between two approaches to, to understanding neural computations. Uh, so one approach, which is kind of kind of the classical approach is to, uh, well, tries to sort individual neurons into separate functional classes uh, based on how they uh, represent different task variables. So this approach was, well, pioneered in, in the sensory cortices uh, where neurons are typically classified in terms of the receptive field. Uh, so it was very, very successful in the, in the navigation system where everybody knows about, uh, you know, place cells, grid cells, head direction cells, and there are many unders, boundary cells, object cells, uh, you can go on <laughs> for a while. And, and so this approach was also attempted in, in higher cortical areas uh, where, uh, well, people have proposed that there are choice neurons, uh, so neurons that, that, that encode categories or, or neurons that encode rules, numerosity, and, and so on. So, so this is the classical approach, but there, there are at least two issues with this, this approach. So one is that, uh, so suppose you just classify neurons like this, it's, 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 it's actually quite hard to understand how computations are, are performed still. So that's, that's one issue. Uh, another issue is that in, in a sense, so all these pictures here are kind of the best case examples. And, and so in the last uh, 10 years or so, people have started to grapple with the reality that, um, well, the activity of neurons is more, or is more complicated. And so uh, a seminal, Paper in the field uh, is, a, is a study by Valerio Monte and David Cicillo when they were in, in Bill Newsom's lab, where they revisited the, the classical uh, random dot par paradigm. So, so, so this is an extension of the random dot decision-making task where a monkey needs to take, make a decision. So either based on the motion of the dots or on the color of the clouds. Uh, so depending on, on the contextual compute. And so they recorded the activity of many neurons and. Prefrontal cortex, but without pre-selecting, very much like the, this classical choice neurons of, uh, of Mike Shadlin. Uh, but but they found that actually, well, many almost all neurons had some information about the choice, but they also had information about other uh, task variables, such as, for example, the motion of the stimulus. So, so actually, interpreting individual neurons is 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 is, is, is very difficult. So the so the neurons have what what was called mixed mixed selectivity. So what, uh, what Monte and Cecilia proposed was a different approach where, which deals with the whole population at once and represents the activity in what, what is called the neural state space. So where each axis represents the activity of, 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 of one neuron. And then the population activity can be represented as a temporal trajectory in this, in, in the, in this state space. And so this is, a, this is a very high dimensional state space. So if you, if you record 1000 neurons, so it's a 1000 dimensional state space. But what was found over many, many studies is that the activity typically lies in low dimensional subspaces of the state space. So typically the next step is to look for low dimensional projections of these trajectories that carry information about the computation. And in this, so in this, in this paper, they found a very nice uh, uh, projection. So where one axis, so the, 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 the vertical axis represents the stimulus, the motion of the, in the stimulus, and the, the horizontal axis represents the, the choice made, made by the monkey. And so the different trajectories here correspond to different coherences, so different motions of, of the random dots. And what you see here is basically how neural, the trajectories of neural activity transform information about the stimulus, which is on, on the y-axis, into information about the choice, which is on, on, on the x-axis. Okay, so basically the, the dynamics transform stimulus into choice. So this, they give us a picture, a very compelling picture of the computation. And so this, is, this, is, this has become a very ex famous example of what has become a broader framework, uh, which was called computation through, 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 through dynamics. And so this, basic, this framework basically posits that uh, while the neural dynamics in, 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 in the state space, so it should be thought of as, as a low dimensional dynamical system, and then the, the nonlinear dynamics in this low dimensional dynamical system implement computations. Uh, and, and so this approach has been actually very successful in a variety of, to explain a variety of computations and, and in particular activity in higher uh, cortical areas, such as the prefrontal cortex and, and, uh, and, the, and the motor cortex. Uh, however, so, so this is, so this, this approach here is, is very different from the original cell class approach. It actually doesn't 
assume anything about the properties of individual neuron. It treats all the neurons completely equally, and it's completely agnostic to this classical type of, 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 of cell calls. Uh, so, so right now in the field, so we have this dichotomy. So we're on the right side, we have the kind of more traditional approach in terms of, of functional cell classes. And then we have this new, newer approach in terms of collective dynamics. And a, a key question, which, which is basically the big question of my talk is whether these are completely exclusive points of views. So should we completely give up, for example, functional cell classes, move, move completely to collective dynamics or do both play, play, play a part, are, are both important for understanding neural computations. And so one, one reason that people did not give up yet the, this functional cell class picture is that biologists really believe that cell classes are, are a biological reality. So you can actually define classes of cells in many different ways uh, using uh, different indicators so, such as morphology, connectivity, uh, genetic markers, uh, the, the, the activity. And, and, and the hope is that so these biologically defined cell classes can be connected to functionally defined cell classes uh, to, well, to link basically computations to the un underlying uh, biology. Uh, so over the, the, the last couple of years, so more effort has been investing in re-examining this concept of functional cell classes. And so one approach was to abandon this simple idea. So the simple idea is that individual neurons encode individual task variables. And this is clearly not the case. Uh, but still, that does not exclude the possibility that there might be different groups of neurons that have different patterns of, of, uh, of cell activity. So people have examined this idea. So, so are there different, can we define functional set classes in terms of patterns of cell activity? So, so how does this work? So I will go a bit more into details here because this is kind of at the core of, of my talk. They're sensitive to both choice and, and, and selectivity, uh, sorry, to both cho choice and the stimulus. And then we can quantify the cell, their selectivities, for example, by, by, uh, by computing regression coefficients to, to different uh, task variables. And, and, and then so we can represent the activity of the whole network of neurons in what is called, what has been called the selectivity space. So, so here, so what is this selectivity space? So it's a space where every axis is a task variable such as motion, choice, uh, uh, color and context in, the, in, in, in this task here. And then every point is a neuron. So every point, every neuron is characterized by selectivity to all the task variables. And then, it's, it's, and then the whole population is represented as a cloud in, in, in this in the selectivity space. And so then the next question is, so is there any non-random non structure in these clouds here? Or are these clouds completely, completely random? So all, all, are all the neurons statistically equivalent or can we distinguish groups of, of neurons? Uh, and so, so to illustrate the, the analysis, so let me just take a, uh, a kind of cartoon scenario here where we have two data sets. And so now again, different points of different, different neurons. And, and so we plot the selectivity in the selectivity space. So the selectivity space is in general higher dimensional, but I will be showing only two dimensional projections. Uh, and then the question is, so is this, are these cloud of, of points different uh, from, from a null distribution? Uh, which is which will be called well a random random structure and this null distribution usually is taken to be uh, a, a multivariate Gaussian. So, so basically, what people have done is compare the selectivity so this cloud of selectivity to a null which is which which is a multivariate Gaussian uh, using uh, well a specific uh, summary statistic that I will not get into. But basically, if so if this distribution is different from, from multivariate Gaussian, well, then people have said that this is just random population structure. So there's no population structure. While if, if, it's, if it's different from, 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 from this null distribution, then this is called non-random population structure. Okay, so why have I gone into this? Well, two, oh, so, sorry. So one more thing is, so, so, so if, so if this distribution is different from, from, from null, then, uh, then a possible next step is to actually define clusters. So use a clustering algorithm and then define functional cell classes based on, 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 on these clusters. 
And, and so, yes, so I took a bit of time to go into details here because so the key issue in the field has been that two, uh, well, two, 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 two seminal studies have applied this, the same analysis to two different data sets collected in animals performing different stuff and they, they reach opposite results. So, so Raposo et al. to look at the multisensory decision-making task and they basically found no evidence for a non-random structure. So what they found is basically that there's no, no well, no functional cell classes in there. Uh, now, more recently, so Hirokawa et al. applied exactly the same analysis, but now in, in, in so this is in rats, performing a, a more complex value-guided decision-making task. And what they found is, is that actually uh, th this population structure was non-random, and then they could define functional cell classes based on this clustering. And then uh, they also found that these clusters that they obtained were actually related to the underlying connectivity of, of the neurons that they were, they were So basically these two studies uh, got conflicted, conflicting results. And there's been a debate of why is this? So should we think about the cortex having functional cell classes or, or, or not? Uh, and so one possible resolution to this debate, so one explanation that has been brought forward is that, well, to actually reveal functional cell classes, uh, well, we need to use tasks that are complex enough. So, so one suggestion was that maybe this task was too simple and it was not rich enough to reveal the, the uh, different populations with different uh, cell activity, while this more complex task allowed, uh, allowed to reveal those, those populations. So, and this brings, this brings forward the really, uh, well, fundamental theoretical question, which is, so if you th think in terms of neural computations, do specific computations, is it the case that specific computations require to have separate cell classes, uh, or can we implement any computation just relation structure? And so this is, this is really the key question of, 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 of my talk here. So, so basically, uh, well, going back to this fundamental dichotomy, so now if we extend a bit the, the definition of what we mean by, uh, by cell classes or subpopulation, so do, do collective dynamics that implement uh, computations, do they, do they require functional uh, subpopulations to implement certain computations or can we implement any computation uh, with, with a random uh, subpopulation structure? Okay, so this is a this is a really a theoretical question, it's a computational question, and so we address this question uh, using uh, uh, computational models. Uh, so, so in particular, so, so well specifically, we use recurrent neural network models. So, so in 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 recent years, so, so there's been a, a, a strong trend in the community to use uh, networks that are well models that are into the interface between neuroscience and uh, and uh, artificial intelligence so so recurrent neural networks are a simplified set of models that include some of the basic uh, bi biological constraints in terms of uh, well well those are networks that that that, that they're made of individual unit like elements but now these networks are simple enough that well we can use algorithms from from artificial intelligence so in particular back propagation to train them to perform tasks and we can basically train them to perform pretty much any task and then so, so this approach so this training then so, so you can think of it as an exploratory tool that creates functional networks in which we know what the function is because this function is imposed by the learning we know the activity of all the neurons in the, in the network, and we know also the full connectivity in the network. So we, are, in principle, have all the information. And so in principle, we should be able to understand what's going on and manipulate, analyze, manipulate the activity and connectivity to, to understand how computations are. And so this is, this is the kind of approach that you took. So, so we basically trained recurrent neural networks on a series of, of classical systems neuroscience tasks starting from the most classical one, which is the, the random dot perceptual decision-making task. Uh, so then we look at the parametric working memory, so the multi-center decision-making task, which is this task studied by Raposo et al, where uh, animals had to combine two sources of information. Then we looked at the, the Manta task where, the, well, there were also two sources of information, but there was also contextual cue, which indicated which source of, uh, of, of information was the relevant one to this context defining the decision-making. Then we also looked at, at, at a classical delay match descent. Okay, so 
So for each of these tasks, so we, we trained a large number of networks and then we analyzed those networks. So the, so the first step, well, the first step was to apply exactly the same analysis as, as in the experimental data to, uh, to quantify the selectivity of, of the units in the network and to look for whether there is or not structure in, 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 in the selectivity. So, so let me sketch here. So the, the analysis, so we, we take one network trained on a task. And then, so, so, so then we just perform linear, a linear regression of the activity of the different neurons with respect to, to all, all the task variables. And so for every neuron, this gives us a bunch of selectivity coefficients. So, and then we represent the networks in this selectivity space where again, so every axis is the selectivity to one, one of the task variables. And so, and every point is, is a neuron. And now again, in general, so the selectivity space is higher dimensional, but I'm showing only two 2D projections here. And so here, these are examples of, of, of two different networks, two different networks. And then the next step was to apply exactly the same analysis as on, uh, as on the experimental data, which is to compare this cloud of dots obtained from the train network with a null, which is, which is just um, a multivariate Gaussian. Uh, and so, so we look at, uh, at, at this specific summary statistic. And, and so basically, if there's no statistical difference, then we will say that uh, the structure in the selectivity structure is completely random. Uh, but, but if it's different from a null, then we will call this a non-random uh, selectivity structure. So actually, we're, yeah, we're not just going to distinguish random and non-random. We can actually compute how strong this difference is. So we can compute how strong the selectivity. Okay, so this is the summary of the first analysis. And so this is the result we get. So here I'm showing you basically, so these are the, the five different tasks that I introduced a, a couple of slides back. And, and so every dot now here is a train metric. So we train many metrics in, in each task. And, and the y axis is this how, well, how different small, which is just multivariate. And so what we, the pattern that we see here is, is that, well, these three tasks, well, they, they seem to have very, very low or non-existent structure and selectivity, while those two tasks have, have a much stronger structure and selectivity. Uh, and okay, so this is, this is a first step. And in a sense, it su suggests that maybe there, there is something to, to this hypothesis that some tasks require structure while, while others don't. Uh, now, of course, so this, this analysis here is, is purely observational correlation. So we see some, some structure, but for, for the moment, we have no idea if the structure actually um, is causal, whether, whether the computations require the structure or whether the structure emerges from for some other reason. And so, so, so the next step, and actually the bulk of our study was to really understand how, well, whether the structure plays a role in the computations and, and how it plays a role in, 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 in computations. Uh, so, so we really wanted to understand mechanistically, uh, well, how these trained uh, RNNs work. And we'll, so I told you that, so in these models, we, we have access to all the information. So we have all the, all the activity, all the connectivity, but it's still very, very challenging to understand uh, how these models work because the dynamics are very highly nonlinear and we just don't have the mathematical tools to understand in general, how, uh, how an arbitrary recurrent neural network uh, Performs computation. So, so, so the current state in the field is that we need simpler models, which are tractable, so that we can understand. Uh, but so we want them to be simpler, but not too simple. So we want them to, those models to retain uh, well some of the richness of the RNNs. So in particular, the ability to 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 perform many many different computations. And so in my team, so we have developed a class of, of simplified models, which uh, we believe is actually very, very rich and which we have found very useful. Uh, and so these models, so, so we call them low rank recurrent neural networks. So they are a, a subclass of, of, of general recurrent neural networks in which the connectivity matrix is constrained um, in a specific way, uh, meaning that it's, it's low rank. So what does it mean? So, so in general, if you take a ma any matrix, or a connectivity matrix, you can expand it a bit like a Taylor expansion. And then we can keep a couple of terms in, in this expansion. So every term here is the outer product of two vectors. Or, or I'm gonna call these vectors patterns of connectivity. 
and, and so basically we, we can keep, keep a small number of terms. So, and, and so if we keep a small a number of terms that is much smaller than, than the size of the whole network, so we call this a low rank. Uh, a, a, a low rank network. So, so the bottom line is, is really that these low rank recurrent networks are specified in terms of a small numbers of patterns of connectivity of the neural networks. And so before going further, so, oh, yeah. oh do you know we keep exactly the same nonlinearity. So, so this is the same as the general RNN. Um, so yeah, I don't have the equations here. <laughs> so, so I, I, yeah, I was asked not to. <laughs> so, so, so basically, okay. So every neuron is specified by by a variable x, which is the input current. So, so, so this x is is the sum of all the inputs. So that part is linear. Uh, well, not, and then it produces an output firing weight, which goes through nonlinear x, which is phi of x, which is you can take whatever. You, so we here we use a hyperbolic tangent, but it's basically sigma is function. Let me say some nonlinearity. So this, the nonlinearity is, is still here. So, so I'm not touching the nonlinearity. I'm just constraining the connectivity matrix to to to, to belong to to to, to a certain class. But it's a very important question because it's, it's, we're not making any assumptions of non of linearity, and that's very important. Okay, so, so why are we looking at this specific class of, of models? So, so when we started this, this work, well, we, we realized that many of the classical models in the literature actually have this, the, this structure hidden uh, within the surface. And so the most, the most famous example are, are Hopfield networks, our tractor network, uh, as well as the, the ring model of uh, time Polinsky. but then a number of more recent uh, uh, modeling frameworks actually rely on exactly the same structure. Um, now this kind of low rank structure, so that's also something very, very common in statistical models, in particular when you do dimensional analysis reductions, we usually uh, actually, uh, well, you do low, low rank uh, of, of, of a matrix, and the structure also appears, so we could, we could show that the structure appears when we just train networks using the back propagation. But, um, Really, the most important motivation for us is that so, so, so the models that we obtain, so these low rank network models, are uh, attractable, are mathematically attractable in such a way that we can really interpret, understand what, what, what is going on. Today. And they're also highly, highly expressive in the sense that they can, we can show that they can actually in, in, implement any, any possible computation. So they're universal. In sense. So, uh, so let me just quickly summarize. So, so what we mean by interpretable? So, how do we interpret these these computations? So, okay. So, so I started from this general RNN, and I told you that. So, we constrain the connectivity matrix to be low rank, and in low rank networks, well, the low rank networks can then be represented in terms of these patterns of a neuron. So, so the inputs to the network are a pattern of weights. Uh, the output, the readout, is also a pattern of weights. And then the connectivity matrix is also represented in terms of, uh, of a set of, of patterns of, of weights. And then, so the relationship between these patterns uh, determines the dynamics and, 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 and the computations. So, so let me show you a little bit more, but still without really going in, in, in the details. So, so if you look at the, so, so some, uh, I'm going to focus on the, on the rank one network for simplicity. So the key property of these networks is that the activity is actually constrained to lie in a low dimensional subspace uh, of the full neural state space. So, so remember, so this neural state space, so that's a space where every, uh, every axis is the activity of one neuron. Well, in those networks, the, the activity is actually, is actually confined to, to plane in, 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 well, to, to hyperplane in the, in the space. And so we can, uh, we can parameterize the activity in terms of a small number of latent variables. Okay, and then we can reduce the dynamics to the dynamics to, uh, of these late, uh, latent variables, and we get some picture which is very similar to what I showed you in the uh, well in the mountain Susilo paper, where we have uh, well uh, the dynamics in a low dimensional space, which, for example, re represent how inputs are transformed in, 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 into outputs. And so, in general, for any low rank network, so we can reduce the dynamics to a low dimensional latent model, uh, which can be represented as an effective circuit. 
Uh, and so the, the variables here in the effective circuit are these latent variables that, that describe the, the, the collective activity. And the interactions are basically set by the connectivity, uh, by the connectivity. Okay, so, so we have this, this theory, which I'm summarizing very briefly here. And then we can use this theory to ask, well, in which case, so for which computations does the connectivity need to have a population structure to, to implement the, the, the relevant uh, dynamics? So the next thing that we did is, so remember I looked, I showed you that the networks we trained had some, some structure in selectivity. So the next thing we did was to, to constrain the networks to be low rank. So train low rank networks and then look for structure in the obtained connectivity. And so how, how do, we, do we do this? So, so this low rank network, so the, the, well, they're, they're represented in terms of these patterns. So we can rearrange these patterns. And so every neuron now has an entry on each of these, these patterns. And so now instead of, so before I represented neurons in the, in the selectivity space where every neuron had a bunch of, of regression coefficients. So here we can represent every neuron in the connectivity space where every axis now is the connectivity along one, one of the, the, those vectors. So, so in this case, so this will be a four dimensional space and I'm showing a couple of, 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 of PDT. So this dot here is, is one neuron, so the connectivity of one neuron. And then we can represent the, the, the whole network as, as a cloud of dots in this connectivity space. Now. And so we have now, well, a cloud, a cloud of dots in a space that it's very similar to, to, to the selectivity space. And now we can look for, for structure in the connectivity space, because what we expect is that the structure of selectivity actually is, is generated by, by the structure in, in, in connectivity. So we can apply exactly the same pipeline to the connectivity as we did for, for selectivity. So we, we start from trained lower rank networks, and then we, we represent every neural, every network as a cloud of, of points in the in in this in this selectivity space, and then we can ask whether the, the thin cloud of, of dots, well, whether it's, it's, it's different from from an old distribution, which is again a multivariate Gaussian, and so we can look at again at the summary statistic, and and distinguish basically well quantify how different the distribution is is from Gaussian. And so if it's not different from a Gaussian, then there's basically no uh, population structure in the connectivity at all. Uh, while if it's stronger different from, from a Gaussian, then there's a clear uh, population structure. So I is neuron, sorry. So I is the neuron, neuron neurons. So, 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 sorry, so every, every neuron, so that's the little eye. The big eye is the index to the network. It is the index of the different neurons. So, so we have n neurons, and I'm just plotting. So every every eye is is a neuron. So maybe this is confusing. So the dimensionality is basically the fact that there's only one pair of vectors. So this is the dimensionality. So this is the rank of the network. So, so here I'm, 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 I'm simplifying, I'm looking at the, the rank one networks. It has only one pair of, 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 of connectivity vectors. Yeah. Exactly. So, so basically what, so when we train on different dots, we can look for the minimal dimension. So minimal rank that, that the dots has. So that's, that's kind of a hyper Okay, so, so now, yes, yeah, so now this is getting a little bit technical. So rank one, okay, so the dimensionality is set by the rank plus the number of inputs. So, so, so let me go back to, to, the, to the 13. Okay, so here. So, so basically, so this is a rank and one network with a single input. And then the, the dimensionality, so the activity is, so part of the activity will be driven by the inputs. So that, that you will always have. So the dimensionality cannot be smaller than the, the dimensionality of the input. And then this, the recurrent connectivity actually adds dimensionality and, and the amount of dimensionality that it adds is, is equal to the rank of, of, of the network. So, 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 so basically the effect of the recurrent connectivity is to increase the dimensionality by, by, by
correct. Uh, so let me let me then continue. Is, 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 uh, okay. <laughs> So, so uh, all right, so this is just a summary of, of then the analysis. We basically do the same analysis on the connectivity as we did on the, on, on, on the selectivity. And then, uh, and, and then we can plot the results in a similar way. So we have a different task. Every point now here is a, a network train on this task. And the y-axis is how much structure, how much non-random structure is there in, in the connectivity. Okay, and the key point here is that we get a result which directly reflects selectivity. And which is something that we could have expected, but basically the tasks that had no structure in the selectivity, they also have no structure in the connectivity, while the, the tasks that had some population structure in the selectivity, well, they have a structure in connectivity, which actually presumably generates this, uh, the, the, the structure in, 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 in the selectivity. But, okay, so this analysis still does not tell us that this structure is required, that it's causally required. So, so we're going to do one more analysis, um, to, where we're going to manipulate the connectivity. So we're going to basically to, to scramble the connectivity and basically scramble this, 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 this structure that, that we see here, and then check whether the network can still do the, the computation it was trained on after, after, the, after the structure was, was, was scrambled or not. And so here's a, again a cartoon of what exactly we, what we're doing exactly. So the beginning is the same as before. So we, we start from this to train networks, we represent them in the connectivity space, but now we change. Well, basically we're, for every neuron, we resample the connectivity parameters from the underlying null distribution, which is this, this multivariate fashion. So we replace the connectivity by another instance of the connectivity, but which has the same statistics at, uh, at the level of, of this null distribution. <laughs> All right, so, so that basically, so that way we basically generates new networks, which are just basically, well, in which the, the, the population structure is, is, is scrambled by definition, but other statistics are up to you. All right, I, mean, I, I don't really mind that. <laughs> Maybe I should wait for the team to come back. <laughs> well, anyways, so, so, so we basically, well, generate new networks with a, with a scrambled population structure. Now we can quantify for every task, for every network, well, how well the network is doing the tasks once, which we, once, which we, once we have completely reshuffled the population structure. And, and what we get is a picture that is very similar. So now, now one here means, uh, well, perfect performance. And networks that are orig originally trained networks on the task well basically have full, full performance of, of one. And then what we see is that these resampled networks in which we removed the, the population structure, well, they, they basically do the task less, less, uh, less well. No, no, so this is without retraining. So that's, this is, this is really a, yeah, the, the key analysis that you do. So what we keep is, is just the correlation structure between the patterns, because this is not, so it's not, Completely random. There's still correlations between the patterns. So we keep that, and the rest we, we, we mix up. Okay, and and so at this point, so I'm going to just put everything together. So so these three analyses that I showed you just to, to summarize. So so okay, so we looked at networks trained on these different tasks, uh, and what we find that well, this is a common pattern uh, of structure and selectivity, connectivity. Uh, and, and in the performance. So we, we see that there are two tasks that really stand out and that appear to require a non-random population structure. And so what are these two tasks? So these two tasks are this context is this dependent decision-making and the delay match to sample task. And so what is special about those tasks? So, so there's something common in between these tasks, which is this, those tasks are flexible input-output tasks. So in those tasks, so basically, if, when the network sees an input, the output depends on an additional piece of information, which is the context. So in this case, so, so when the network or, or an animal so is, a, is a stimulus, the required output depends on, on whether it's supposed to integrate color or motion. While in the delay match to sample task, so, where, so, so this, this, in this task, well, the goal is to say whether, so to get two pictures and the goal is to say whether the second picture is the same as the first picture. So when the network sees this, this, the second picture, the correct answer actually depends on the previous picture. So, so the correct answer for the same picture depends on, on something else. 
this is some some flexibility as well. Okay, so, so so this suggests that this flexible input output task might re require a, a non-random uh, population structure. But can so can we go beyond this and understand whether well whether this is really the case? So if we add populations, can we can we solve those tasks? Um, so so what we did then is to to take one more step. So so, so, so this, again now we're looking at this connectivity space where we where we found a non-random population structure for these tasks. And so we know that this distribution is statistically different from a Gaussian, but to characterize it so we can go one step further and actually use a more complex distribution, for example, a mixture of Gaussians. And a mixture of Gaussians is basically obtained simply by uh, clustering. And in other words, so it's assigning every neuron to a population. And now every population, each population has the given Gaussian statistic, but the two populations have different multivariate Gaussians. And so now what we can do is so starting from this train networks, we can cluster the connectivity parameters and now resample. So we generate new networks, but sampling not just from a single Gaussian distribution, but from, from a mixture of Gaussian distributions, which was fit on, 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 on the train. And so this is the result we get for these two tasks. So now this is again task before performance. So this is the fully trained uh, uh, low rank network. So then, well, if you resample based on, on just a single population, so meaning no, no population structure, so the, the performance goes down. And then when we actually fit two populations, the, 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 uh, the performance goes up basically to the, to the same level. Okay, so it seems that, so this, the networks really require at least two populations to, to, to perform these tasks uh, correctly. Uh, okay, so this, this, this shows that these subpopulations do have a functional role, uh, but there's still a question of what this role is, so mechanistically how this works. And, uh, and actually, so we can really answer that question, but now I'm, I'm kind of getting to the end of the talk. I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to really, uh, well, Summarize this part. So, so to understand this picture, so I told you that in this low rank framework, so the, the dynamics of the full network can be reduced to latent dynamics, so the dynamics of a couple of latent variables. And the interactions between these latent variables are basically set by the structure of the connectivity. Now, if you have connectivity, which is represented by a mixture of Gaussians, which is what I did, just did in the, on the previous slide. Well, we can directly determine the form of the circuit and we can show that the properties of the different populations basically sh shape the effective interaction between these, these latent variables. So basically the final outcome of, of, of our analysis is that for, okay, so, so for every task, so we, we train networks and then we can determine the minimal rank for every, for, for, for every task. And we can determine the minimal number of populations for, 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 for every task. And moreover, we can reduce the train network to, 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 to a very simple latent model with, with only a couple of, of variables where the number of variables is set by the rank of the network. And, and this connectivity, this effective connectivity between the variables is set by, by the connectivity. And in particular, so when we have more than one population, then so this effective connectivity can be modulated depending on, on the different conditions in the task. So, um, and, and, and really the key point is that having more than one population, well, allows a greater flexibility in the dynamics by modulating the form of this, of this effective circuit. And I'm going to, to very quickly summarize this just for, for this task here. So this context dependent decision makes stuff. So now again, this, in this task, so the network or sees a stimulus that has two features, uh, which are here are called A and B by its color, color and motion. And then it has to pay attention to either one feature or the other, depending on, on some uh, additional contextual inputs. And so how does the network do this? Well, in terms of this, so we can represent the network in terms of this uh, uh, well latent, latent circuit. And what we find is that between the two contexts, uh, well, this contextual inputs modulates differentially the gain of the two subpopulations that we identified. And then, so this gain basically modulates the strength 
of, uh, of the input that is integrated by the recurrent dynamic. And so we basically get selective integration uh, by gain, gain modulation, uh, which was actually proposed before, but here we find it at the level of the collective latent dynamics, rather at the, at the level of individual. Dynamics. Okay, and, 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 and so this is, this is a, yeah, this is a more general mechanism, which we find is its play also in, in, in the other tasks where, where we have more than one population. Okay, so so at this point I'm I'm, I'm going to wrap up and, and to zoom out again to to to, to, to where, where I started from. So I started from this di dichotomy between these two approaches in in, uh, uh, in the community, which is on on one hand cell classes, on the other hand collective dynamics, and these two these two approaches look uh, very very different and, and and pretty much exclusive. Um, and so what we find by well analyzing this metric trained on different tasks, so we find that. So if we extend a little bit this concept of, of sub, subclasses of subpopulations to, to be a little bit more flexible, in the sense that that's in the individual neurons are not selected to, to single task variables, but they are patterns of selectivity to different task variables. So what we find is that for certain computations, so this point of view is actually essential for understanding how the collective dynamics implements um, the task. So these two, Perspective. So this is this is really a false dichotomy in a sense because it's, 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 it's computationally they give us really complementary perspectives on, on how uh, neural dynamics uh, perform perform tasks in, 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 in computations. Uh, all right. So, uh, so some, I'm I think I'm I'm out of time. I'm, I'm going to to stop here and I just want to to uh, acknowledge again to, to thank my uh, all, all my collaborators who who, who did all, the, all this work and thanks a lot for your attention. Questions. Oh, from the, uh, very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs>